Thank you, Nancy. This morning, as I was uh, out and about, God brought a verse to me from the rising of the sun and to the going down of the same. The name of the Lord is to be praised. And isn't that why we're here today? To praise the Lord who is in control of our lives. Everything that's happened to us this week is God's in control. And we're here to praise Him for how good He's been to us. And I'm so glad that you're here today, um, especially if you're a visitor. We're super excited that you're here. And uh, we want to welcome you, give you a warm welcome, and hope that you have a good experience with us this morning. If you would, do me a quick favor. If you're a visitor, maybe reach in front of you and grab one of those visitors' cards, fill it out, and if you would place it in the offering plate when it's passed later on in the service so we could just have a record of your visit with us, that would, that would be great. But I hope that you have a wonderful experience with us today. And uh, I know that there were several times this week as I was traveling about, I thought I saw uh, Noah uh, go, by the, uh, go by me in his ark with all the rain and storms, and, uh, um, but I'm glad that it's sunshiny today. And so as we continue our worship, let's stand and just greet one another this morning. <laughs> Well, we are so glad you have decided to join with us in worship this morning here at First Baptist. And um, we're going to start by singing to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Redemption, the purchase of blood to 
great things he hath done, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our victory when Jesus we see. songs that are sung, the, the message that is spoken today, that someone's heart will grow to come to know you, Father, and just uh, continue to bless this hour service. In your holy name I pray. Amen.
is so sweet to trust in Jesus. We'll sing all four verses and our ushers will come at the end. Let's stand and sing together. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know the sin Jesus, oh, for 
trust in Jesus, just from sin itself to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy. it is so sweet to trust in you God and we thank you for all your many blessings God we thank you for this day and this time of worship God we thank you for the opportunity to come into your house to fellowship with each other God I just pray that you will take these tithes and offerings God that you will use them to further your kingdom God that we will continue to go out and make disciples like you have commanded us God I thank you so much for this church family and what it means to this community God and the service that it provides. God, I thank you so much for this day, and it's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. We are standing in between hope and despair, believing in your grace and the faith to declare you are with us. Hallelujah, hallelujah, you are good. In the ashes and the dust, the sorrow and pain, 
lies the promise of your word and the power of your name you are with us hallelujah hallelujah you are good and when faith gives way to fear i will trust your heart i will trust your heart when i cannot feel you near i will trust your heart i will trust your heart There's a message being written in the morning sun And a new song for the broken Death is lost, love is won You are with us Hallelujah Hallelujah You are good Hallelujah Hallelujah, hallelujah, you are good. Hallelujah, I have tasted. Hallelujah, I have seen it. Hallelujah, you are good. Hallelujah, I remember. Hallelujah, I believe it. Hallelujah, you are good. You are with us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you are good. Thank you, Matt. Awesome job. When I uh, text Matt earlier this week to ask him if he would sing for us, he said, uh, I definitely will, depending on my, if my voice can make the first week of school. So uh, uh, he made it. So thank you so much, Matt. And, and Nancy and choir, thank you all so much. Nancy stepped in and led the choir uh, today. So great. So thank you. And that off tour was beautiful. Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalms 23. Psalms 23, where today we're going to look at verse 5. Psalms 23, 5. But this week I came across a group of, I read about a group of third and fourth graders who were asked to complete this following sentence. To me, God is. To me, God is. And this is what a few of them wrote. Amanda wrote, forgiving because he forgave in the Bible, and he forgave me when I went into the road on my bike without one of my parents. Brandon answered, providing for, because he dropped manna for Moses and the people, and he gave my dad a job. Paul said, caring, because he made the blind man see, and he made me catch a very fast line drive that could have hurt me. He probably sent down an angel. I like that one. Jeremy wrote, merciful, because my brother has been so nice to me for a year. <laughs> and another child wrote, faithful, because the school bill came, and my mom didn't know how we were going to pay for it. And two minutes later, my dad called, and he, got, he just got a bonus check. My mama was in tears. Well, the truth is, God is so awesome. He is so fast and infinite that he presents himself to us in so many different ways. No one word or picture or metaphor can convey the whole of who he is and what he can do. So we see in Scripture that God is our powerful creator, and he's a reigning God. He's a redeeming Savior, but he's also our loving Father, a strong rock and safe refuge, and those are just a few. 
And each picture communicates a special and an important aspect of, of our awesome God and our relationship to him. So to this point in Psalms 23, David has described God to us as his shepherd. Using this image, David has conveyed that the Lord is completely devoted to caring and providing for all his needs. And as we come to verse 5, the metaphor suddenly shifts a little bit. David now portrays God as a gracious host who serves David in a grand banquet hall with a lavish meal. So let's look at it together this morning in verse 5. David writes, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Did you see the little shift? Remember in verses 1 through 4, David describes an outdoor field. But here in verse 5, it's an indoor meal. David transitions from a spacious uh, countryside to a grand banquet hall with green pastures to a dining table from still waters to an overflowing cup. But even with this shift in the scenery, this verse sticks to the dominant theme that runs throughout this psalm, and that is God cares for his people. God cares for his people. Whether God is pictured as a good shepherd or a gracious host, whether David sees himself as a sheep or an invited guest, the message is the same. God is attending to the needs of David, and he will do the same for you. So this morning, let's look at the table, let's look at the oil, and let's look at the cup. First, let's look at the table. Growing up off our kitchen uh, was our living and dining room, and it was a very special room. Uh, it, it was pretty big. It had white carpet, all right? And uh, it had um, nice furniture in it. It had uh, my mom's piano sat in it. Um, it was full of nice, important, untouchable decorations. And uh, it also um, had the walls were full of uh, family pictures. Um, like I said, it was a very special room. In one side of the room, there was a, a china cabinet. The china cabinet was full of all Mama's special china and specialty plates. And, and, uh, but the centerpiece of the room had to be the dining room table. It was big and nice. And there was a fancy chandelier hanging over the middle. The table was covered with a nice cloth, a tablecloth. It was set with all the nice china and silverware, cloth, napkins, and special glasses. There was candlesticks and flowers in the middle of the table. There was even these little fancy cards to be filled out with the name of whoever was sitting in that seat. It was really fancy and nice. So fancy and nice that my sister and I and our friends were not allowed in the room and when we were little. So my mom and dad loved to have family and friends over so often. When we would have company, mom would uh, cook a feast, and they would use the fancy dining room table. Now, I always wanted to eat at that table, uh, but I either was not old enough or there wasn't enough room for me to eat at the table. So dad, when we had company, would always go to the closet and pull out a table kind of like this, an old card table. It would be placed somewhere in the house for all of us kids to eat. It was called the kids table. And at that table, we would have paper plates, styrofoam <laughs> cups, plastic silverware, and paper napkins. And we were kind of left to fend for ourselves. Anybody know what I'm talking about, the kids table? Well, in our passage of scripture this morning, David writes, you prepare a table before me. And the picture here is a large banquet hall. And here God himself is preparing a lavish table just for David in order to serve him a meal fit for a king. 
Now, the word prepare here means to arrange, to set in order, to set in place, to, uh, to ordain. We would normally think of David doing the serving to God, but here it's the totally opposite. God is attending to all of David's needs. God is setting the table before David and putting everything in the right place. The dishes are perfectly positioned, the drink is poured, and the meal is cooked and served. Every detail has been given the closest attention. Nothing David could possibly want has been overlooked or admitted. And the good news today is the same service is available for us too. As believers, we are given a seat at the dining room table, and we are treated like the guest of the king. And throughout the feast, the Lord's eyes are upon you anticipating every one of your needs. And, and in his perfect timing, he brings to your table exactly what you need, precisely when you need it. Now notice with me that this is in the present tense. This is not something God just did a long time ago. It's not even something God does every once in a while. It is what God always does for his people. He prepares a table before you. It's also so important to notice that David doesn't only say God prepares a table before him, but David goes on to say that God prepares a table before him in the presence of his enemies. David knew what it was like to have enemies, didn't he? For a lot of his life, he was surrounded by enemies. I think about when he was, lived a life as a fugitive, running and hiding from Saul, or when he had to flee for his life when his son Absalom led a rebellion against him. And here it is, David is sitting at the table in the presence of his enemies. Now how in the world could he do that? Well, from this verse, we can be assured that even in the presence of his enemies, David felt confident in the Lord and trusted in him. Though his enemies were present, David had no reason to fear because God was with him. And what God did for David, he will do for you too. So how do we keep going in light of the many pressures and burdens and conflicts and troubles in our lives? By trusting God. Even though life may be very difficult at times, like David, we can have complete trust and dependence on God because he has prepared a table just for you, even in the presence of your enemies. The table. Now, let's look at the oil. David writes, you anoint my head with oil. Now, olive oil was a common staple in biblical times and had many uses. One usage was an ancient custom of hospitality and respect shown to important dinner guests where the host would pour the guest's head with oil. Now I wonder if I have any guests here today that would love to come up here and let me pour some oil on their head. We've got several. I doubt it because that's kind of awkward and odd for us today. But in that day, it was a special honor and showed how important that individual was to the host. So from this, we could see how important David was to God. David was an honored guest. And I can't help but to think when David says, you anoint my head with oil, he might have had in mind the day that he was anointed as king. You see, oil was also used in the Old Testament to commission certain people for the work that God had called them to do. Prophets and priests and kings were all anointed with oil because God had given them a particular assignment. So this oil spoke a purpose, a calling, an assignment. If you look sometime in Samuel 16, 13, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. You see, God had a plan for David. He had a given work for David to do. He had a purpose. And here's the exciting news this morning. God has each of one of us work to do also. Uh, Paul reminds us in Ephesians, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. 
God has before, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I read a story about a prospective teacher noticed that one day a little girl in her class was having tr- trouble with a math assignment. She knew the girl was a little shy, would never ask for help. The teacher went to the child and offered her assistance. After she had helped the child work through the math problem, the little girl thanked the teacher, and the teacher replied, that's one of the reasons I'm here. And the little girl thought about it for a moment and then asked, well, what's the other reason? Do you know the reason that you're here? God doesn't make mistakes and put people in the wrong place. He creates people and gives them a plan and a purpose. Most of you know that I love sports, and players and teams work hard and train for the purpose of being successful in, in a game. This past week, I got asked to go running with some of our, our, our kids that are, are training for the cross-country season. And then later on that day, I went out to the field and watched some of our football players in the middle of the heat, hot, hot heat, practice to get ready for the season. Champions are not made in the middle of a game, but in the middle of practice leading up to the game. Legendary basketball coach John Wooden said, it's not the will to win that's important, it's the will to prepare to win. Winners prepare because they know why they are there. A couple of years ago, the University of Oklahoma's coaches gave a blank iPad to all the players, and later they handed out a digital, play, digital playbook. Each player was to take their iPad and write out what that player thought their, their thought would be his purpose on the team. What would be their purpose? And I like the response of their kicker, Michael Honeycutt. He said his purpose is to kick the ball through the uprights. Growing up, I remember taking Alabama history, and I was fascinated with George Washington Carver. Uh, George Washington Carver had many opportunities. When he finished his doctorates at Iowa State, he chose to come to Tuskegee Institute. The salary was little, but he knew the purpose in life came from an invitation from Booker, Booker T. Washington to work and to make a difference. He knew why he was going to Tuskegee. George Washington Carver later wrote, no individual has the right to come into the world and go out of it without leaving behind him distinctive, legitimate reasons for having passed through it. I pray my work at Tuskegee became my reason for living. He made a difference, not only in Tuskegee, but in the world. God has created you with a purpose. Do you know your purpose? God anointed David's head with oil, and he went off to do great things. Finally, David ends with the picture of the cup. Maybe you've had this experience before. When A few weeks ago when we were on vacation, we went to, out to eat at one of our favorite restaurants, and as we were waiting on our food, I ran out of drink. I kept sitting there thinking and talking and listening to everybody at the table, but I was thinking I sure wouldn't mind some more tea. You see, a good host keeps the cup full. Charles Dickens' book, Oliver Twist, is about an orphan who at the age of nine goes to a workhouse. Oliver, who labors with very little food, remains in the workhouse for about six months. One day, the group of hungry boys decided to draw lots. The loser must ask for another portion of gruel. The, the task fell to all, Oliver, who at the next meal nervously came up forward, bowl in hand, and begs Mr. Bumbley, the head official, for gruel with the famous request. Please, sir, I want some more. Now, this is the total opposite of the picture we have in Psalms 23. Uh, because the picture here is of a cup overflowing. It's kind of like this. If you're sitting there and you have a cup and someone starts to pour and just keeps pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring, the cup overflows. 
David says, my cup overflows. There's a story about a, Paul Harvey tells about a three-year-old boy who went to the grocery store with his mother, and before they entered into the grocery store, she said to him, now you're not going to get any chocolate chip cookies today, so don't even ask. She put him in the car and, and sat the little child's seat while she wheeled down the aisles. He was doing just so good until they came to the cookie section. He saw the chocolate chip cookies and stood up in the seat and said, Mom, can I have some chocolate chip cookies? She said, I told you, son, you could not have any. You're not going to get any at all. So he sat back down, and they continued down the aisle. But in the search for a certain item, they ended up back down the cookie aisle. Mom, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies, she said. I told you you can't have any. Now sit down and be quiet. Finally, as they approached the checkout line, the little boy seen that this may be his last chance. So just before they got to the line, he stood up on the seat of the cart and shouted in his loudest voice, In the name of Jesus, may I have some chocolate chip cookies? Everybody around hearing the boy just laugh, and some even applauded. And according to Paul Harvey, due to the generosity of the other shoppers, this little boy and his mother left with 23 boxes of chocolate chip <laughs> cookies. And here, in our scripture, David uses the cup to remind us that the blessings of God to us in Jesus Christ are never rationed. From the fullness of his grace, we have received one blessing on top of another. His goodness and grace just keep coming and coming and coming. It overflows. We see this all through the Bible. When Isaiah describes God's forgiveness, it's not enough for him to say that God will pardon. He says God will abundantly pardon when the psalmist describes how God brings hope, it's not that he just says, with God there is redemption. He says, with the Lord there is plenteous redemption. Paul speaks not of just the riches, but of the unsearchable riches of Christ. And Jesus speaks about not just giving life, but giving life more abundantly. And this is what David is writing about here. Abundant pardon, plentiful redemption unsearchable riches, abundant life. My cup overflows. I love what Jesus said in John 15, 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. I once heard about a church from North Carolina who went on a mission trip uh, to a leper colony on the Caribbean island of Tobago. The team met a lot of sad patients afflicted with leprosy, but one unforgettable experience happened at one of their worship services. The lepers came in and took their seats on the pews, of the, and the mission team led them in hymns. The pastor of the group was a man named Jack. He noticed that there was one leper on the, the back row who was facing the opposite direction. All the rest of the lepers were facing the song leader. And Jack announced, we have time for one more hymn. Does anyone have a favorite? And about that time, this leprous lady on the back row turned around and for the first time faced the song leader. Jack said it was something that was shocking, something that he'd never seen in a human being. She had no nose, no lips. Her head was almost just like a skull. And when she raised her arm in the air, she had no hand. Then this leprously lady said, Can we sing, Count Your Many Blessings? It was at that point that the whole mission team experienced something that they had never experienced before. Here was a lady with re relatively nothing to be thankful for, asking to sing, Count Your Many Blessings. At first, they couldn't even sing. And then they sang the song with totally new meaning. When upon life billows, you are tempest-tossed. When you are discouraged, thinking all is lost. 
Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord hath done. The truth is, this morning, we can't count high enough to list all our blessings. One, two, three, ten, a hundred, thousand, ten thousand. Because my cup overflows. The table. God has prepared a place just for you. The oil. He has anointed each one of us with a purpose. And the cup, it overflows. So let's count our blessings. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm so thankful that you're such a huge God, so vast and infinite that just not one word describes who you are. And um, God, I thank you for this beautiful passage and I thank you for this beautiful verse that just reminds us of who you are and what you've done for us and what you continue to do for us every day. God, thank you for uh, thinking of me as someone special, that you've prepared a place for me. And even though I live in a world that's crazy and sometimes feels like it's falling in on me, that you're there to take care of me. You know everything that's going on, and you know when I need the next course, and you know when I need another napkin, or you know when it's time for dessert. You, you take care of me in every kind of way. And God, I thank you for the picture of the, the oil. God, I thank you that you just didn't create me to just to, to flounder on this earth, but God, you created me and each one of us with a purpose. You have anointed us and have given us a purpose, a reason for being here. God, I pray you would help me every day to live out my purpose for you. And God, thank you for the picture of the cup. And God, how your blessings overflow in my life each and every day. Help us to remember how good you are to us. In Jesus Christ I pray, amen. Well, as we close our time together this morning, I'd love for us to sing hymn 412, The Savior is Waiting. And maybe you're here today and maybe God's touched your life in some kind of way. Maybe for the first time you need to ask Jesus to come into your life and to save you of your sins. I would love to, to sit, stand down here and talk to you for a minute. I would love for you to come and spend some time with me. Or maybe you are uh, been visiting our church for a couple of weeks or even a little while and, and uh, maybe you experienced something today that you like about our church and you would love to come and, and, and unite with us as we serve our community. We would love for you to do that. Uh, maybe you just want me to come down here, pray right where you are. Whatever your decision is, let's do that now as we stand and sing.
Well, thank you for being here today, and it's been such a privilege for each one of you to be here today. And, um, but I will say that there is a couple of people here that I'm especially glad that they are here today. Uh, uh, Mr. Barbara, uh, Miss Barbara, and Mr. Gary Walker, who served as uh, Minister of Music here years ago, is back in town today, and they're visiting and are here with worship today. Some of you would know that. When uh, they left First Baptist Ufala, they came to Ridgecrest Baptist Church in, in Montgomery where I was a, a fifth or sixth grade uh, crazy little boy. And, uh, and so um, uh, it was special that y'all were here today. Uh, as I talked about my mom's table, they enjoyed sitting around my parents' table a lot since they were good friends with my mom and dad. And so... It was extra special having y'all here today, especially today, so, so thank y'all for being here. I'm who I am because of a lot of people, and, and I am who I am because of that couple right there, and so I thank y'all so much for being here today. Uh, Brother Gary, would you mind ending us with a word of prayer this morning? Sanctuary. 